Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be rejoined today by Tony Davis. Now, longtime listeners of the show will remember Tony from uh, from, from back in 2020. Uh, we, we, we had him on when the show first started, uh, and I was really excited to talk to him about something we're going to be talking about a, a little bit again today in a slightly different context, which is 3D and high frame rate and all that, obviously tied to Avatar. Uh, Tony, thank you for being back on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. I always love talking to you. So, uh, like I said, I, let's let's just reintroduce you to the audience. Uh, g- give us your bona fides. Explain to explain to the people who are listening right now why they should listen to you uh, above anybody else. Basically, on the on the topic of three D, high frame rates, theatrical presentation, that sort of stuff. Oh, I don't know if they should live me, listen to me over anybody else, but uh, I certainly have been working in this industry for quite a while, and I've uh, been working on specifically these kinds of uh, technologies. Uh, so I was, um, you know, my last, you know, kind of big job was at uh, RealD, where I ran the technology group. Uh, RealD is the company that does uh, 3D glasses uh, in about 30,000 theaters around the world. So if you go watch a 3D movie that's, uh, you know, not a Dolby or IMAX, you're watching almost certainly on a 3D on a RealD system. Uh, but I've also been working uh, with cinematographers and um, and with the directors. On uh, and and most of what I worked on was actually not 3D, but was actually frame rate uh, related work, and uh, that's my company Tessive. I've been doing uh, jitter reduction and frame rate work for uh, a kind of a longish time now. So that's that's where I uh, my background is is in um, and my actual uh, my my uh, technical background is I'm an electrical engineer. So I came at this from the mathematical standpoint. So I look at frame rate as a fairly straightforward sampling theory problem. Um, and not a mystical problem to be solved with, uh, you know, thinking about fireplaces and all kinds of weird things that happen in the industry. So I, uh, in my review of Avatar The Way of Water, I, I discussed frame rate a little bit. I gave the very layman's explanation of what, A, how film works, but B, also what high frame rate is compared to standard frame rate. Um, but since since you are here and you are, you are again, the, the expert, can you can you explain to folks what... What frame rate actually means? What it, what are when we when we're discussing frame rate? What does that actually mean? Well, one way to think about frame rate is uh, everybody knows what you know an image resolution is. So if you look at a at a two D picture, you take a picture with your camera, and you say, oh, it's got this many pixels across. It's got this many megapixels, and we understand that as how the camera is breaking up um, you know the picture into lots of little little dots, little pixels to represent it and store it onto the uh, into memory and all of that sort of thing. Um, and that's something we call spatial resolution. So that's resolution and, you know, horizontally and vertically, we break up the picture. Frame rate is fundamentally the exact same thing, but in time. So we're breaking up the real world, not into uh, little pixels in X and Y, but into time. Uh, we've got a separate picture. Every so often, the camera takes another picture and it stores it. And, that, and then we... That's how we play it back. We take these pictures. We take, you know, you remember film. It had all these little frames on it, and we would, you know, project it onto a screen, and we go frame, and then the picture would go black for a second while it advanced the the film to another frame, and then boom, it showed that other picture. Uh, but frame rate is a measurement of resolution. Ultimately, it's just like measuring resolution on a two dimensional image. We're measuring resolution in time. How resolute uh, is our system, our camera and our projector in representing the real continuous world, because the world does not made up of frames. The world, the real world is just always moving and things are happening. How are we breaking that up into little frames and putting it onto a screen to reproduce that motion? And how, how well are we doing that? You know, at, at what, um, what amount of information are we putting there? Because there's some limit to how much we want to do it. The limit used to be how expensive film was. We didn't want to spend just tons of money on film, dragging it through the camera and projector at the super fast rate. We needed to pick something that looked okay and you know represented motion. Um, but now we're tweaking with all these knobs because we're not messing with film anymore. And so it's basically a resolution. Well, so, okay, so the kind of standard frame rate that everybody understands as cinematic motion, that when you mm-hmm. when you see a movie, this is the thing that you recognize as this is what a movie looks like. And it looks different from sports. It looks different from 
uh, you know, uh, I don't know, video at home, whatever. It, 24 frames per second, right? That's right. That right. is. And I, I'm just curious if you know, was was that how was that settled on? Was that just uh, there were there were earlier other frame rates. If you look at older movies, yeah. they, they, they unspool at a different rate and it looks it looks kind of weird. Right. Yeah, it's so um, what happened was uh, before we synchronized with the sound, uh, frame rate in movies was not particularly well settled. Uh, what would happen is because a lot of the older cameras were hand cranked. So there would be a cameraman and he would crank it by hand and he would do, you know, they were kind of this is how fast I'm going to turn this thing and how much film I'm going to run through. And there would actually be projectionist notes on the other end to say, hey, you know, in this scene, you should probably crank a little faster when the projectionist is playing it back. And in this scene, you should probably slow it down a little bit. Um, when, uh, when sound synchronization came along and we needed to put audio with things, having that go on was not going to be acceptable. Uh, and even before that, even in silent film, they kind of realized they needed to standardize this. And what they kind of, there was a big survey of all of the, uh, you know, kind of what do people normally crank the film at and this sort of thing. And they kind of came up with, well, 24 is about right. Slower than that. And the motion doesn't look very good and faster than that. And we're paying a fortune in, in film. But they had to pick the actual number, and 24 frames per second was picked at that time. And that's when it happened. Yeah. Um, so uh, 24 frames per second, that's kind of what everybody thinks of as standard. That's mm -hmm. what we, we think of as as what a movie looks like. And the reason, of course, we're talking about frame rates today is because the big movie in theaters uh, right now is Avatar The Way of Water, um, which is being shown – in many, but not all, we'll discuss this in a yeah. second, in 3D HFR. Uh, HFR is just the, it's the abbreviation for high frame rate. Uh, mm -hmm. If we slip into slip into that, so folks know. Um, and it is unspooling at 48 frames per second, which is not necessarily the standard high frame rate, right? I mean, we, we discussed this a little bit before the show, but I, when I saw Gemini Man mm -hmm. um, uh, in 3D HFR on an IMAX, it was, I believe, what, 120 frames per second? Yeah, Gemini Man was 120. Uh, there were some 60 frame per second releases and 24 frame per second releases of Gemini Man. They had three frame rate outputs for that movie. Why Why the difference? Uh, well, I mean, I, mean I, I, I understand why you would show it in 24 frames per second versus uh, 120, but why do 60 versus 120? Well, 60 was... Uh, so some projectors weren't really capable of 120, and so you'd want to do a 60 uh, for those that, that couldn't do a 120. And 60 still looks very high frame rate. Um, I'm not sure how many actual exhibitions were made at 60, but I do know uh, that the uh, home release of it was at 60. Um, and uh, it, it had to do with trying to find frame rates that, um, that the projector, projectors can widely support. And uh, 120 is fairly widely supported. Actually, uh, roughly speaking, you've got choices of uh, 24, 48, 60, and 120. Those are basically your choices on, on modern projectors. Um, and there's reasons to use one or the other. Uh, it has to do with what numbers divide evenly into others. Um, 24 doesn't go into 60 evenly, but it goes into 120. Uh, uh, it, it has to do with if you want to double up frames or not, and so mm -hmm. without some kind of funny cadences. So that's there are some interesting choices. So there's the kind of the 48 frame per second group of, of HFR, which doesn't really go to any other frame rates very well. Um, you can you can d divide it in half and get back to 24. Uh, and then there was Gemini Man. They took 120. They could divide by two and get 60, and divide by five and get 24. And that's that's sort of how these things worked out. Okay, so now explain explain to me the layman what I am seeing when I am seeing forty eight frames per second versus twenty four frames per second. You know, I, I, I folks describe it sometimes as motion smoothing, like uh, which is a, a which is which is wrong for a bunch of reasons. But I can I understand the 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 logic of that description because there is an um, it just looks different. Um, mm -hmm. But what am I seeing when I am seeing 48 frames per second versus 24 frames per second? Well, I mean, the short answer is you're seeing twice as many frames displayed on the screen, obviously. Uh, it, but what's what's going on is it, you have to understand that 24 frames per second, while it represents motion, is an extremely low rate of reproduction of motion. Um, our eyes really can see... Uh, Easily 120 frames per second uh, is is really what we're we're capable of. That is, our eyes are capable of up to uh, 60 hertz um, uh, resolution, and to represent that 
you, you need twice that in terms of frame rate. And it's, it's just, there's a factor of two that's always needed. So 24 frames per second can only represent correctly 12 hertz, which is a really, really, really low frequency, and your eyes can see it. You're basically, even though we don't kind of think this way and we don't process it this way, we are seeing all the lines. We're seeing all the all the frames, and we're seeing a very long time in between those frames, and we've just gotten used to it. So we, we sort of have to leave the math for a second and say, what does it feel like when we watch a 24 frame per second movie? Because for all of us who've grown up with movies, since we were children, we saw movies at 24 frames per second and we were, our brains are trained that that's what a movie looks like. You know, uh, uh, Casablanca and Star Wars look like this. But what we weren't really recognizing is, although we knew it and we walked out into the real world, it didn't look like a movie. That frame rate became an aesthetic. It became something that meant something to us. It was the signal to our brains of this is a movie. This is Star Wars. This is Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is not real life. And it's it's kind of like, you know, it's to the real world like a watercolor is. It's not very like a real world. It's very animated looking. So when we start leaving that look, when we start to increase the frame rate and make that picture on the screen look more and more like what the real world looks like to us, our brain sort of rebels. We're like, oh, no, 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 this is Star Wars. It's supposed to look like this, not smooth and like the real world. What, this veil is being removed. It's no longer the kind of paint inside the lines look that we had. And we're really off the rails as soon as that happens. Uh, uh, the aesthetic is now different. And that means that this is now an aesthetic question. Do you do you want this high frame rate look or not? And how is that going to play when people watch it? And also, people adapt to it. As people watch high frame rate longer, they start to see it differently. So there are people who've never seen high frame rate before, and they kind of rebel at this look. Then there are people who've been seeing high frame rate for years, and they just kind of ease into it and say, oh, yeah, this is great. This is a movie. So... Mm -hmm. It's just highly dependent on the audience, on how long the audience has seen high frame rate, and what the artists are trying to do with it. I, I want to I divert slightly for a second uh, from where I was going to go with this, because another way people describe the look is uh, like the soap opera effect, mm -hmm. uh, right. which is, again, I, I don't think it's quite right, but I, I understand it. But do, do soap, is a soap opera shown at a different frame rate? Is it, be, is it, is it because it's shown via video versus film? Like, what's the... Yes, yes. Uh, that's actually really interesting. The reason we call it soap opera effect is because soap opera is one of the few things on television, on, on U.S. television, that was shot at fully 60 frames per second. It's 60 fields per second. It's interlaced. But television was 60 frames per second. Um, and uh, it's um, it was just because of the timing of how they had to do it. They didn't shoot to film. In the early days of television, uh, a lot of shows were shot – uh, were shot, of course, done, they were done live at 60 frames mm -hmm. per second because TV is a 60 frame per second medium. Uh, and then the reruns were shown at 24 because there was a 24 frame per second camera watching a video tube. And then mm -hmm. kind of somewhat famously, uh, Lucille Ball uh, insisted that her show be shot on film at 24 frames per second and shown that way, which is one of the only reasons, one of the reasons it's the only show that's kind of still around from that time because it archived very well. But what happened is nighttime shows, dramatic shows, three camera comedies, and everything that's drama was all shot on film from that time forward and then, you know, displayed on television. But it was 24 frames per second mm -hmm. in the United States, except for soap operas or, or, your, or, your, or the news or your local news. All of these things were all uh, 60 frames per second. Um, this is different in Europe. In Europe, uh, they did a lot more video for everything. And so it was all 50 frames per second everywhere. So people in Europe rebel a lot less at high frame rate than people in the United States. Here, we're kind of trained that if it's premium content, if you're watching the best drama or a movie or anything good on TV, it's 24 frames per second because it was shot on film. But everything that's kind of cheap and tawdry, you know, the soap operas, mm -hmm. they're 60 frames per second. And so that's kind of an extra layering of what we think looks good and high quality versus what doesn't. It's kind of funny. That is interesting. Is that is that the difference between NTSC and PAL? Yeah, uh, uh, NTSC is uh, 60 fields per second or 59.94 for reasons that have to do with original sin. Um, and uh, and then uh, uh, in Europe, PAL is 50 frames per second, exactly 50. Yeah. This is this is a thing. Uh, as any physical media uh, enthusiast will know, the difference between getting a disc that will play on your 
a player at home and and not is a it's a very complicated thing. So I yes. have long accustomed myself to looking for the NTSC versus the PAL sticker. Yes. On uh, on on products. Um, all right. So back to back to back to today. Back to today. Yes. Uh, again, the reason we're talking about this is because of Avatar: The Way of Water. Now, as we were discussing before the show, it is exceptionally frustrating to try and figure out what format this movie is being shown in on which screen at which times yes. right yes it uh, i'm i'm actually personally made crazy by this i have not been able to see the hfr version of avatar yet and it's not for lack of trying uh i went to a nice imax showing and it was beautiful it was a fantastic showing i, I live in uh, austin texas uh, i went you know i'm not exactly in the boonies and uh, it was it, it was difficult to find a, i thought going to an imax uh even you know i, I was like oh this will be a high frame rate no they're not all high frame rate which which imax did you go to in austin uh, forget the name of it, but it's, 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 it was p- coupled with a Regal. Uh, okay. So it's not the Bullock. It's not the, no, they, and the, that, that one, that's I'm, like the big, big yes, one that, that I am certain that one, and that's where I'm headed next. I am certain that one is high frame rate. Uh, cause that one is also a, uh, laser IMAX. And if you look on the IMAX website, they will tell you, uh, it, with little, little icons, kind of the capabilities of the different IMAX, uh, uh, auditoriums, um, mm-hmm. But there are actually a couple different laser versions uh, of IMAX, and uh, then this one was the uh, the slightly older uh, dual dual projector uh, linear polarized IMAX. But it, was, it looked it looked fantastic. I'm not I'm not really complaining, except I wanted to see the high frame rate, so mm-hmm. I'm sad. So I let's I, how how are audiences supposed to, I, aside from just like. Going to Fandango.com and like hoping that the 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 theater has reported correctly what the capabilities of each screen are. I mean, is there a way for folks to know what the where what's going to be showing where? Uh, I, I look. I haven't figured it out yet, and I you know <laughs> okay. I I have uh, yeah. This is very frustrating. Uh, 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 it gets me to. I'm sorry to go on a little rant, but I want to rant. Okay, because it's very frustrating to me too. I've had a. I've had a dozen people ask me, "Well, should I see it in this or should I see it in this?" And I, the first couple of people I told, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting your rant. Oh yeah. But the first couple of people rant. I told, I was like, "You should go see it at IMAX because all the IMAXs are showing it in high frame rate." And yes. I quickly found out that was wrong. Yeah. I I was just wrong. And I think that's true of. So and and if you go say oh well, go see it in Dolby um, I'm I think all the Dolby's are high frame rate but they're not all 3D uh, and so mm-hmm. that's one of the things you have to watch there uh, and then uh, if you go to uh, the different chains because uh, uh, the the big three uh, Regal Cinemark AMC they they run about uh, half the uh, the auditoriums in the in the country um, there's differences between the three of them which ones are going to be doing high frame rate or not and in which auditorium and it's very uh, a little bit fluid apparently i don't know i don't know how you find out and here's the thing there has been a conversation in the industry for years about why should people go to watch a movie in the movie theater and, and not just wait, wait and watch it at home and i i I will tell you, I, I have had so many conversations with executives at different movie chains where I was trying to sell them on, uh, you know, some upgrade to the imaging system, to, you know, to their lenses or to their screens or things like this that I was trying to say, okay, let's, let's do something that's not, that's cost effective, that makes this better than watching a movie at home. Because what's happening is you're going to lose out to streaming. You're going to lose out to home, you know, audiences. And everybody agreed, yes, we are in big trouble if we don't do something. And that image quality is a huge part of it, uh, that image and sound and seats and the whole experience. I mean, it's more than just that. Um, uh, As a side rant, when fewer people are going to movie theaters, could we potentially on these big empty parking lots expand the stripes just slightly so I can get out of my car? I would like that. But anyway. That's a side rant, and it's way cheaper than new uh, new uh, recliners. So, yeah. I, I, there is an understanding in the industry that image that quality is important. It's difficult to quantify how important it is to get. You know, is this if we spend you know five thousand dollars on a new lens or or twenty thousand dollars on a new lens for this auditorium, will it pay off with more people coming to watch because we have a new lens? Well. People don't think that way. They don't show up because of the new lens. But I will tell you, if they don't know which theater is good and which theater is not, 
they're going to get frustrated. And so even if we're not spending more money on new lenses or new projectors, can we at least tell them where the good ones are? Because even within a brand, I understand if you're marketing between things, but, but if I'm, you know, one of the big companies, you know, that runs auditoriums, could I at least send my customers to the good one if they care? That's what I want. Right. And it is super it it is super frustrating. Again, I've had folks uh, ask me and I thought I was telling them the right thing and I was not telling them the right thing. But as you mentioned, even within the premium large format screens like mm -hmm. your Dolby's and your IMAX's, it's not it's not entirely clear. I mean, I, I you know, I and I think every other critic in the world at the press screenings saw it in a on a Dolby uh, branded AMC theater that was 3D and HFR, right? Right. right. Um, but I will say that I also, uh, you know, I well, I live in Dallas now, so there's only really one of those theaters, and it was it was it looked great. It was it was wonderful. Right. Um, but in DC, there are two or three of those theaters within relative close proximity to each other. There's one in Tyson's Corner. There's one in Georgetown uh, at the AMC there, and there's one in at the AMC Hoffman, I think. Um, right. And I think. I, I, again, I don't know for sure, but my understanding is that I think only the Tyson's Corner Dolby is showing in uh, HFR 3D, which is a problem. Again, like yeah. it's if if you were telling people, if you were telling people, you have to see this in the biggest, best screen possible, and then you kind of like pull the rug out from under two thirds of those screens. How are people supposed to understand a know where to go or b trust the theaters going forward? Yeah, and I I don't know the answer to that. It's um, I do know that there is um, partly there's there's a lot of there's a lot of you know kind of fingers you know working on this problem right because the the studios and the director I mean James Cameron himself very much cares about how people see his movies he always has uh, and um, it's it's uh, and Disney cares Fox before when uh, with uh, other movies cared a great deal uh, the last large movie that um, James Cameron was pushing out was actually uh, Alita Battle Angel because that was mm -hmm. his production group. And uh, I know that that Fox at the time cared very much because James Cameron cared very much that the 3D presentation of that movie be excellent. And that was uh, there was a huge push to, uh, to with the exhibitors to um, just remeasure and clean the screens, get things tidied up, get the optics clean, get the bulbs changed before this movie came out and kind of uh, represent that that had happened. Um, so there there was on one hand, a drive for uniformity and there, that they are uniformly good. And so there is one push that says, okay, look, every theater you should go, you go to should be excellent and we shouldn't have to brand these things. But that's just not true. And I think that's been a shift in the industry to say, look, we just need to either place these in better auditoriums, uh, which is something that, that the studios care about. They're kind of asking, hey, could you, could you put this only in the auditoriums that it's going to show well in? That gets complicated with the Dolby's and IMAXs, uh, and they obviously do have slightly different uh, outputs for for their stuff. But in you know standard theaters, there's this push for for standardization so that the audience doesn't have to care about this sort of thing. Uh, and in fact, that's that push kind of works. If you go into a standard theater, uh, an AMC, Cinemark, you're probably going to have a pretty good experience there. It's just uh, and a lot of those will be HFR, but again, you won't know which one it is. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's something that has got to be driving Disney crazy right now. I know it's it it, it makes them very frustrated because they, they want everybody to see it in a way that they enjoy. Yeah. I will say, uh, again, if you if you look at Fandango, some theaters will have uh will will have the information there. Um, some don't. Uh, so pay attention and if you if you have questions, you can always call. I know it's a pain in the ass. I hate getting on the phone as much as anyone else, but you can't always call the theater and ask. They'll usually uh, have have a good idea. And I think it's worth it. I do think it's I, I, I would be curious, uh, you know, next week to, to get your take on the HFR um, and what it what what you what you made of it, because I you you, you were a little skeptical of the 48 versus uh, 120. I was I was skeptical of. Well, so I'm skeptical of a couple things. But uh, so first of all, uh, is having seen the movie in 24, I hundred percent believe it will be a, a better experience at 48 in a lot of the scenes. Uh, there are many scenes in that movie that were 
clearly shot to be seen at high frame rate. There's a lot of action going on and a lot of things that lose detail at 24 frames per second. And this is one thing audiences don't usually know is there's actually a lot of, there's a lot of movie language, cinema language that is actually built around 24 frames per second, how fast you can move the camera around, uh, how fast you mm -hmm. can pan, how fast action can go on. Uh, because that frame rate is so low, a lot of times the camera is moving in very kind of stately, you know, gliding paths that are very slow so that we don't, you know, cause the audience to become uh, uh, sick, frankly. There were things going on in Avatar that were breaking those rules where they were going way faster and there was more going on. And I, I really believe the 48 version of that uh, will be spectacular. I, I am a fan of high frame rate presentation. I'm used to it. I've seen lots and lots of it. One of my concerns, though, is um, and I really want to see how this works is and I've heard people talk about this movie switches back and forth between 48 mm -hmm. and 24 frames per second. Um, and it does that to try to bring the audience along that some scenes are more difficult for people typically to process. The weirdest thing is scenes that are actually not moving very much, just dialogue scenes. People rebel more at those in high frame rate when things aren't even moving very much than uh, a big action sequence. And so uh, the movie is is playing with that a little bit. It's moving, it's trying to to give the audience kind of the best of both worlds, the high frame rate when things are moving fast, 24 when it's not, although I understand that it's not real consistent when that happens and I really wanna see when they do it. Um, but going back and forth has its own problem. The problem is, uh, Audiences do get used to a frame rate. Usually after a few minutes, people are used to a frame rate. And if you drop it back to 24, it sort of breaks our brains because we suddenly have to go back to this very low cadence. And it, I've actually seen people uh, flinch, like physically flinch. When I've done this in, in test theaters where I've been running a high frame rate. And then I, so what I'll, my, one of my favorite thing, everybody's favorite thing to do who plays in this world is take the same scene and you show it at 24 and say, what do you think? And everybody's like, ooh, that looks nice. And then you show it at 48 or 60, and everybody says, oh, I don't really like that. Then you show it at 48 or 60 a couple more times, and then people say, oh, yeah, I actually like that one a lot. Okay, yeah, that one's good, even though it was exactly the same one. And then you show them the 24, the first one, exactly the same clip as the first one, you show them that one, and they say, ow, that's awful, what's that? And because they've gotten trained on the high frame rate, even in those few minutes, that switch back to 24 hurts and they sometimes and i always i'm always looking backwards at the audience when i do this they wince uh when you go back to 24 there's kind of this this uh, this reflex um these are very learned kind of things and i worry about switching back and forth but i will tell you i am not sitting here in my humble abode in Austin, going to second guess James Cameron and this sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I, I trust him that the movie's probably fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I will say, look, I'll say, again, I, I wrote this in my review uh, at the Bulwark. Um, it is literally like nothing I've ever seen before. I mean, it, 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 it Gemini Man was really, really good uh, as just, just a visual experience, set aside the actual mm -hmm. narrative, whatever. Like, just as a visual experience, it was really interesting and really well done. Um, but this, I think, goes to another level, and whether that's just because of the the combination of the HFR 3D, 4K, whatever, on top of the motion capture technology that that Cameron it was, has, it was amazing. Um, perfected. I mean, it, like I, I, it really, it's. A friend of mine said it's 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 it, every couple minutes he just sat there and thought, wait, none of this is actually real. I know, like none of this actually exists, um, and it's insane to think about. Um, and it's that's obviously not true. There there are some real things, but like it is, it really is something else. Um, but I will say that watching it in uh, uh, on the Dolby HFR 3D uh, system. One thing that I noticed and that I've seen, especially some of the very serious detractors of this format uh, notice and, and call out, is that it does, the the image does seem to shudder uh, a bit, uh, like, kind of like, uh, to use a, to use a reference people might, uh, might, might understand, it's like playing a video game system, uh, playing a video game on a system that's one 
uh, one system too old for it, right? So it's yeah. like playing a playing a PlayStation Five game on a PlayStation Four. Um, there's just some there's some shuddering. It's like the computer is like trying to catch up to the image. But you you think it, you, again? You haven't seen it, so you can't say right. for sure. But you think that that's just an uh, that's not the heart. That's not a hardware problem. That's a our brain problem. I think it's I think it's exactly what I was just mentioning. Uh, so the way that they actually accomplished this is that the 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 movie is in fact a 48 frame per second. Uh, uh, digital sequence all the way through it's just in areas where they want it to be 24 frames per second they just repeat the same frame twice uh so that makes it 24 frames per second so the projector itself isn't doing any frame rate switching when you're watching this it's 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 always doing the same thing and i would be uh, very surprised to uh to imagine that you know one of these uh, projection systems actually did stutter while playing these frames that's that's a huge no-no and i've i've basically never seen that happen um, even at high frame rates and, uh, and things like this. What I think happened there is when it switched back to 24, that was the time it took your brain to, 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 to kind of re, you know, go back into mm -hmm. its suspension of, of uh, disbelief that it needs for 24 frames per second, which really is a lot of suspension of disbelief, uh, that, that we yeah. do in our heads. Yeah, I mean, I, I I am also loath to second je second guess James Cameron on something like this. Yeah. I will say that it, if your goal is immersion, this is unimmersive. It it reminds you that you are you are watching a thing on a screen and kind of being led through it. And and what it reminds me the most of, um, frankly, is uh, Christopher Nolan and his use of IMAX in Dunkirk and The Dark Knight Rises to right. a less extent, lesser extent, The Dark Knight Rises more because it, like in The Dark Knight and Inception and The Dark Knight Rises, he has the IMAX sequences, but they're like sequences, right? It's like, here's, we're doing a big action sequence. It's, this is now in IMAX format. We're watching it this way. But in Dunkirk, he was switching back and forth a lot. I mean, the only reason, um, and the, he was doing this because he couldn't shoot with an IMAX camera on the boat, right? Like oh, he right. Couldn't, he, Got it. he couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't get. So it was. It was just regular. But it's. It's really distracting. Yes. It's really, really distracting. And as much as I love Christopher Nolan, and again, I would question Christopher Nolan about as much as I would question James Cameron on most things. If your goal is immersion, then you are losing the audience. You're losing that battle with the audience when you're making these switches. I think that's right. I. I, I mean, I. I am, uh, and there's been really different um, approaches to this. Uh, in in um, Gemini, Gemini Man, um, Ang Lee did work very hard, and that's a movie that I, I was a little associated with. Uh, he worked very hard to bring the audience into the high frame rate. So there was kind of limited motion and things at the start, and then they just kind of dr gradually move you in, and they just stay there. We stay at 120 frames per second the entire movie, uh, and you know that's i think that's probably helpful um the, there was a, a secondary goal with that movie to try to get to get audiences trained to watch high frame rate movies and not object to them as much and I mean, look this has been going on a while there was the hobbit there's been uh, uh billy lynn's long halftime walk and gemini man and these movies and then there were there were pushes for high frame rate before we did actually in our frame rate discussion to skip a few yeah in the 50s there were some 30 frame rate 30 frame per second uh, uh systems um and then there was uh they played with uh, 60 frames per second. Uh, Douglas Trumbull uh, had a system, experimental system, that was 60 frames per second film in the 80s uh, called ShowScan uh, that a lot of people saw. I've seen uh, footage from ShowScan that's been digitized and shown now. It's really amazing. Um, there have been a lot of pushes what for was, this. But what it, was Trumbull trying to do with his 60 frames per second? Same thing that everybody's been trying to do, try to allow, allow more motion on screen. Um, mm-hmm. You know, this is something that it's interesting because this is a push really coming from directors and cinematographers, right? There's this push for high frame rate is coming from there because they're the ones who are the most uh, familiar with what they can't do. This limitation, mm -hmm. this technical limitation for them is huge. Uh, you plan out an action sequence and you're like, well, that's going to be really cool. And then you're like, well, we got to slow everything down and, and, and stop doing that and things can't move so fast or it's going to, it's going to hurt and people can't see it. So that's why they've always wanted a higher frame rate. They wanted a better palette. Uh, to paint on um, but the audience is sort of rebel at it so there's been this kind of general push of hey can we in just general ways and in you know kind of ease audiences into a higher frame rate so that we can do this in future because we think that people will really love it 
once they get past that initial revulsion. And I don't know. I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I, I kind of, uh, what I've seen in tests is uh, just go for it. You want to do high frame rate? Just do high frame rate and go f- and just push it. And people will be fine with it after a little bit. And uh, the other thing is, uh, if they're not movie critics, uh, one of the funniest things is there's a good chunk of the audience who can't tell the difference. Uh, they don't rebel at it. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm just watching a movie. They don't care that it's 60 hmm. or 48 or 120 frames per second. These are the same people who uh, can't tell if the motion smoothing is turned on on their television, right? <laughs> you know, I, I was actually curious about that because I do think that there is – I think there is a section of the audience that – either either doesn't notice or doesn't care or prefers it, frankly, mm-hmm. because this is what they've gotten used to watching on their TV at home. That's right. I think I think that's the case. And one of the things that I always uh, argue with, uh, I'm not arguing like, uh, you know, just uh, uh, like we're getting into a fight. But, uh, you know, I, my, my position is the technical display of a movie. Uh, so how uh, pretty it is, the brightness, the frame rate, the sound. All of this contributes uh, not to people's kind of, you know, um, you know, giving a good review saying, oh, yeah, that that frame rate was fantastic. Or I just love the brightness and the the lack of vignetting of that of that lens was the reason that I loved Top Gun. No, what happens is, um, you know, I went and watched Top Gun uh, Maverick with somebody. I took them to a, a Dolby theater. Mm-hmm. And they sat there and they pumped their fist at the right times. They were just transported and they just, this is the most amazing movie I've ever seen. This is the best movie I've ever been to. Now, Top Gun Maverick is a fantastic movie, but I pointed out to them, I said, look, if, if we'd watched this at home, you would have enjoyed the movie, but it wouldn't have transported you in the same way. All of these technical aspects play into just like the score and the cinematography and other things, they play into the emotional, uh, 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 you know, kind of transport of the audience in a way that the audience is not aware of and probably will never be able to put their finger on it. But it's all important. Every piece of it's mm-hmm. important. And I think that high frame rate will do that. I really am a big believer that high frame rate can add to the immersion and transport. And I think certainly in a movie like Avatar Way of Water, which is just mind blowingly beautiful, absolutely stunning. I think HFR is a fantastic idea for that. Uh, and I think audiences should give it a chance. They really should. Yeah. Uh, why do you think the Hobbit, uh, the first the first of the Hobbit movies did not work for folks in HFR? Because I, I, I've never I've never heard more complaints about a presentation than I have with that movie. Um, and I don't know if it was just because they weren't expecting it and they were kind of blindsided by it or if they there just hasn't been enough or if there was something that Jackson himself just wasn't doing right. I think there were several things going on with those movies. Uh, there was a huge discussion for years following those movies. Why did that not work with people? Um, I think that uh, part of it was timing. It was just very early in people seeing HFR. So it just, it just hit them too quickly. They're like, oh, so, uh, suddenly this, this 48 frame per second kind of shows up. I think that they suffered from something that um, uh, a little bit that, that other things have suffered from. So the move to, to – um, when we moved, when television moved to high definition, one of the problems was that they had to change a lot of things on set. They had to change the makeup and they had to change the sets. They had to change a lot of things because it just showed more. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and so a lot of the, you know, uh, the, the tape holding the sets together, you know, together and things like this, you couldn't have that anymore. So you had to spend more on your set and you had to spend more on the makeup to make everything work right in and HDR uh, or, uh, um, um, uh, in, uh, uh, 2k, uh, you know, um, HD HD, television. 1080p. Yeah, HDTV. Yeah. I've gotten all the acronyms mixed up in my head now. You can't, you can't blame me. Um, and I think the same thing is happening with high frame rate. I, when we saw a high frame rate, it is essentially a resolution increase. Uh, things were twice as resolute on the screen, and a lot of things that would be blurred when a, when a character was moving. So, you know, I've got a character moving across the screen, and uh, a lot of the kind of cheapness of the costume – uh, would be blurred away and you don't care. Well, I think we saw it all and we saw the lighting and we saw all the artifice of the movie and it just took us out of the movie. Uh, what Ang Lee thought was that it was going to take a lot more effort to make the movie look good when you have this extra resolution. And he really reinvented a lot of things, a lot of the language of cinema and a lot of things he had to do, even makeup and other things between uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk and uh and gemini man and we see that also with avatar the amount of effort that was put that was spent making every frame look perfect 
when you have so many frames, the quality per frame actually kind of matters weirdly. And, and mm-hmm. it's just, it, I think the movie will work completely. It's just, it's a gorgeous movie end to end. Yeah. yeah I really, again, I, I strongly recommend folks try to find it in HFR 3d. It's, it is like nothing else. And I'm, I'm a 3d skeptic. Uh, I don't love it for, for a bunch of reasons, but like, but this is just this is really amazing. It's it's amazing stuff. I know that kills Tony. Oh no, uh, a part, little part of me dies when people say that. But I, 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 I know I know that kills you. I know that kills you. But the problem is so much. I mean, look, if we're being if we're in the trust cone of silence, yes. you know, plus all the, our listeners here. I, I mean, the the problem is a lot of 3D presentations have been bad. Mm-hmm. You know, the the conversions have not been great. The, yes. the there was a real cash grab sensibility, um, and it turned folks off it of sure the did format. i mean that there's there's no doubt that that's uh that this one on this there is essentially no debate in the industry everybody knows the reason that 3d uh dropped off was that it was essentially ruined by the industry uh, they saw so much money coming in for the 3d upcharges and every single movie went after it uh and movies that had no business being in 3d and movies that spent no money doing a good uh look 3d conversion can be perfectly fine you do have to spend the time and money on it. Um, mm-hmm. Or you could do dual camera, uh, uh, you know, capture, or you can do like Avatar where they're actually rendering it out in 3D, and that's a wonderful way to do things. Um, but it also requires that the, that the director and cinematographer and e- editor, everybody associated with the movie is really spending effort making it a good 3D movie. And I think that now there is an idea that the only movies that are put out in 3D are ones that really have somebody behind them who cares about that 3D quality. Um, so I, I'm hoping that because we are fewer 3D movies coming out for sure. I mean, yeah. uh, it's fewer and fewer. Yeah. They're of better quality than they used to be. And the exhibition quality is actually getting better again. Uh, it had had some, some deterioration, but it's actually getting quite good. Um, it's... I don't think 3D is going to die. I mean, nobody really thinks that. I think it's going to be used where it should be used, and not and not yeah. where it shouldn't. Yeah. No, that would be that would be the best case scenario for sure. I mean, and and sometimes again, I, I say I'm I'm a skeptic, but sometimes when it works, it really works. Uh, you know, speaking of Peter Jackson, his World War One documentary. Um, obviously, they had to they had to do all the 3D work there and uh, post-, post conversion. Um, and they were using, you know, ancient film, yeah, film it, that, you know, and it looked amazing. It, it was did. really, really wonderful. That was a, that was a fantastic use of 3d. Uh, it was the, 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 the technical work on that documentary is just astonishing. I hope people were able to see that someplace. Uh, it's, it really is kind of a, an amazing and very moving, uh, uh, documentary. Yeah. Um, well, uh, as you know, I always like to ask folks if there's anything I should have asked, uh, if there's anything you think fo- folks should know about uh, 3D, uh, you know, I- IMAX presentation formats, what, what, what should... What should everybody be aware of that I failed to, to ask? Well, I think the, the one thing that I would say is um, if you haven't seen Avatar in a movie theater, you need to go do that. And there are a couple of reasons. One is that it's big, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. Go see it in the best quality you can find. You know, go find the best, uh, best you know, premium large format. That could be a uh, you know one of the uh, um, PLFs that like Cinemark or Regal or uh, or AMC have. Uh, or if you go to a Dolby or uh, or an IMAX, you're going to also have a, a, just a fantastic experience. But I have two reasons for saying that. One is that it is this amazing experience in a movie theater, and it's something that's meant to be seen in a movie theater. But secondarily, um, when you later on at home, let me tell you what you're going to miss out on. Uh, it's not going to be 3D at home unless you know you've got a really special setup. Uh, it's also not going to be high frame rate at home, uh, not unless something really amazing happens because 48 frames per second does not go to home TVs very well. Um, mm-hmm. They would have to be an up sample to 60 of in some variety, which could be done. They could also just mm-hmm. given how they are, they could just render out a 60 probably, um, but. It's 60 is what most homes can do and losing out on 3d and losing out on HFR and losing out on that big screen. You're just not watching the same movie. It just isn't the same movie. Um, but if you're in- insistent on watching something at home, that is kind of interesting. I will give a recommendation I've given before, uh, mm-hmm. which is we just talked about it a little bit. Billy Lynn's long halftime walk, which was a 2017 Angley movie. Um, the UHD Blu-ray for that 
is astonishing. If you want to give your home theater system a workout, go buy that disc. I saw it's on sale at Amazon right now. Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Get the UHD Blu-ray set, which does include a 3D 24 frame per second version that you probably won't be able to use. Uh, but you can watch the 60 frame per second, high dynamic range, Dolby Atmos soundtrack. And if you don't want to watch the whole movie, I think the movie is really fascinating. It's a really interesting kind of quirky movie. Just go and it's worth the 20 bucks. Pay the 20 bucks, have it shipped to your house. Go to just the halftime show slash battle sequence, which is an intermixed uh, thing in the middle of the movie. It's about uh, seven, eight minutes long. Watch that with the volume up and you will see something that will just transport you in your own home. And uh, Gemini Man is also available in HFR Blu-ray and it's a really interesting movie and some of the shots on that in HFR are just the motorcycle sequence will blow you away it's just amazing yeah yeah I I am a I'm a big uh I am a big advocate for for Gemini man um I've actually never seen Billy Lynn's long halftime walk so I'm gonna pick this I, I'm gonna pick this disc up now after we end this call because I like to I like to own things yeah it's worth um, owning but, things <laughs> that's great but uh <laughs> But uh, I I do have one technical question with TV. So I mean I so I I there there were things I understand very well about my TV like black levels and all that sort of stuff. There are things I understand less well, which is uh, hertz. So my my TV I believe is 120 hertz. Probably. Yeah. Um, is is that equivalent to fr- frame rate? Is is that like does that mean that I could see something in 120 frames per second theoretically? It, or it is it is related very tightly to frame rate. It is basically the frame rate of the TV. But but um, you would have to get something to transport 120 frames per second to your TV, uh, which a lot of mm-hmm. game consoles can do. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, I think the right. Apple so TV this, can. Yeah. So, so my, my game, the games I play, I, I don't play very many games because I have two children. I yes. don't have time. Who has for, time for this? To 60 hours of God of War. <laughs> We're Ragnarok. adults. We but, don't play games. <laughs> but, but I do, I do, I do play games sometimes. And I will say that it does look, it looks different and it looks better. Um, or I, again, it just looks different. It mm-hmm. looks, it, there's a, there's a much smoother, flow of motion um without feeling kind of motion smoothy uh, type type stuff so is that again is that is that just because it's you know it's processing at uh, well those games are probably processing at 60 hertz but they may be 60 or uh, 120 some of them really are yeah. doing 120 outputs and, and uh yeah i mean and that's one world that where people are just fine with high frame rate is people who come from gaming communities are used to 60 and 120 frame per second outputs uh, and you're just super immersive. You just drop. It looks like you're looking through a window into the real world. Um, yeah. And that's. Uh, uh, but yeah, but the the UHD Blu-ray standard doesn't go up to high. So the TV may be capable okay. of it, but UHD Blu-rays can only do up to sixty. Uh, they don't okay. have a, so. And in fact, uh, Blu-rays also don't have. And this is an important point on Avatar. Like I mentioned, uh, uh, 48 is not supported on home televisions uh, currently, not through uh, Blu-ray. But I, they'll figure something out. These guys always do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you if it's shot at forty eight? I guess here's if if it's shot at forty eight and they want to get it up to sixty frames per second, won't you run into the motion smoothing problem, the the uh, the kind of motion interpolation pro, interpolation problem? It depends on how they do it, but sort of yes. Um, they could do um, they could do a a cadence uh, like we do for a twenty four to sixty, right? So when we watch, uh, so that's the other thing of, of of North American television. When we play back twenty four frames per second on a sixty frame per second television, what actually happens is one frame is repeated twice, the next frame is repeated three times. It goes two three two three two three two three, uh, and that's actually how we do it. So the the frames are actually not on the screen for even amounts of time, um, and they might do something like that going forty eight to sixty. So hmm. uh, I guess it'd go one, two, it's something like I have, I can't do the math in my head, but I think it's something like that. You'd have one and hmm. then one up to uh, twice, but that's going to be kind of weird. And I think you'd see it. Uh, and that got that choppiness of motion, which again, we've gotten very used to on television. I'm not sure we'd be very happy doing that. And the other thing is we could interpolate it. I mean, there, you could actually have a frame, you could frame blend as you're going up to 60 and that's really not a dumb way to do it. Just a simple mm-hmm. fading from one frame to the next. But, um, uh, or you could. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, schools of thought on what you can do there, uh, but um, something will have to be done, and it will not be the same yeah. as it was in the movie theater. Well, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see when it comes out if they just go down to 24. If they try and do, my guess uh, is they'll just, hey. they'll just do the 24. Is my guess, uh, yeah. but uh, that's because it'll get be complicated. But who knows? Maybe they'll be gutsy and they'll do something cool. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, yeah. Fingers crossed. You know, Fingers see. crossed. Yeah, I'm going to get my hopes up on that yeah. one. Hollywood doing something gutsy and cool. All yeah. right. Uh, Tony, <laughs> thank you very much for being on the show again. Um, and I, I, I hope this was uh, super helpful to, to people. Uh, bottom line is just just you got to look at the listings and kind of cross your fingers or, you know, show up to the theater and ask questions. They should, you know, the, the guy the guy manning the desk should should be able to help you. Well, just uh, just go watch it about five or six times at different theaters. There you go. That, well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. You just, you know, this is, uh, maybe this was all just a ploy to get the grosses up because people go and see it in one thing and they're like, ah, that, that, that's not what I, how I was supposed to see it. I got to go see it genius. in the other IMAX. It's genius. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Tony, thanks for being on the show. Uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark and I will be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. We'll see you guys then. Inside look at Hollywood with Michael Rosenbaum. Let's get inside Deborah Ann Wall. If you had to choose between True Blood, Daredevil, to do again. Partially because the Marvel series feel unfinished to me because we got canceled when we thought we were going to have more. Whereas True Blood, we did get to wrap it up. I knew that we were wrapping it up. I could say goodbye to everyone. Ah. I stole something from the set. You know, I didn't get to steal anything from our Daredevil set. Inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum. Wherever you listen.